Avisa cuando me arranque desde el YouTube. Yeah. Welcome everybody. So, uh, welcome to the uh, edition of the ICC UV Colloquia. So we are very happy to go back and resume the colloquia of the Institute, which had been stopped for a while because of the COVID, but now we decided to go online and stream it. So this is through YouTube. In principle, what we are going to do is that the questions, we will take them through the chat at the end. So please ask your questions in the chat if you have any, and we will address them to the speaker at the end. So today we are really happy to have, to go back to this colloquia with uh, such a good speaker like Tony Athing, who is an ICREA professor at ICFO. So Tony actually did his PhD here under the supervision of Jose Ignacio in 2001. Afterwards, he was a postdoc in Geneva, and very soon he got a, a position at ICFO, the Institute of Ozonic Sciences in Castelldefels, where he has been leading the group of quantum information in the, in the institute. So Tony is one of the, probably his group is the, the strongest group in quantum information in Spain. And he, just to give a glimpse, so he basically received, among other things, a starting grant. Then he got a consolidator grant, a ERC consolidator grant. Then he has also obtained a proof of concept grant with another uh, colleague from ICFO, if I remember correctly. And currently he has an advanced ERC grant also, which is for developing the kind of things that he will be discussing today, I believe. And just on top of that, he has a chair, an AXA chair of quantum information theory. So welcome and thank you very much. And please enjoy the talk. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and the nice uh, introduction. Well, it's, uh, I'm, of course, I'm very happy to be here because I I did my PhD in this, uh, in the former uh, Departamento de Estructura y Constituencia de la Materia. And uh, yeah, so it's always uh, nice for me to be back at my, uh, say, at the place where I, I did the PhD. And as uh, Bruno said, uh, I recently got a, an ERC advanced grant. And actually, the title of the advanced grant is precisely what I have here. So I'm going to tell you about one of the main research uh, topics in my group and our, one of our main research interests. Of course, it will be a colloquium talk, so I'm not going to uh, enter into the technical details of what we do. Uh, so I will try to give you first the context, motivations, and then I will try to tell you about the type of problems we are uh, solving and how we do it. Okay, I will, I'll keep talking, I assume. Okay, ahora. Okay, so... Sí? Vale. Uh, should I move here for the slides? Okay. Okay, well, first I will start by very uh, uh, elementary uh, slides. So this is something that I guess many of you know. So what is quantum physics? So quantum physics is the theory that describes, uh, say, the atomic or the microscopic world. And it was invented by the end of 19th century, beginning of 20th century, because physicists made this transition. Okay? They moved from a microscopic world in which we use uh, Newtonian physics to the microscopic world. In, and and they, they realized that the, the, um, the physics we had, the, theory we had at that time for that, which was Newtonian physics, was unable to explain what was happening at the macroscopic scale. And they, that was very nice because for a theory, it's a very exciting moment. You have to invent a new theory to describe phenomena. And this is why uh, quantum uh, physics was invented. And it was a revolution for our theoretical understanding of nature. Okay? So we, quantum physics is really different from what uh, uh, Newtonian physics, uh, I mean, the formalists and the, and the predictions are very different. Okay, so. What is quantum information technology, quantum information science? We are now doing the same transition, but now, uh, let's say, we don't, we understand how this transition took place for physics. Now we want to understand how this transition can be uh, implemented when you focus on information. Okay, so basically what we want to understand is the same uh, uh, process, but now for information. Okay, and we want to know what happens when you move information to the quantum world. So here, let's say, 
whenever you use classical physics, we are happy with classical information theory, but if you put information on quantum particles, then it becomes quantum information, as you will see, and you have quantum information theory. And this is what we want to understand. And uh, sometimes this process is called uh, asecond quantum revolution in the sense that we had a quantum revolution already, which was the invention of quantum physics, and now we want to have a second quantum revolution in which uh, we want to understand how this transition will modify the things we can do with information technologies. And of course this is relevant for our understanding of information, which is a seminal concept in science, but of course it's also relevant from a practical point of view because information is a key concept in our society. Okay, and I think this is one of the main take-home messages from my talk. I mean, this is not this is a, a very general message. What is nice, and I think it was a change of paradigm, is that when you make this transition, uh, what the things you can do with information uh, change. Okay, so here you can do some things, and when you encode information at this uh, a, a, a particle described by classical physics, you can do some things with information. And now we know that you can do different things when you encode information on quantum particles. So you have more powerful computers and a different form of uh, secure cryptography. And I think, as, a, as I'm writing here, I think this is a change of paradigm because this is telling you that physics matters. So I always explain the same. If you had asked me whether putting information on quantum particles uh, had implied a change on the things you can do with information, if you had asked me this question before knowing about quantum information theory, I would have said no. Okay, because one of the good things about information theory is that it has nothing to do with physics. Okay, so for you, a bit is a bit, no matter where you, what, which physics you use to encode it. Well, this is wrong. Okay, so a bit is something and a quantum bit is something different. And the things you can do with information depend crucially on the physical laws that describe the information devices. Okay, so this is, I mean, if you remember information theory, is, I didn't have any course on information theory when I was studying physics. But actually, we now understand that physics matters a lot when you deal with information. And this is evident if you take the, the, the basic unit of information, okay? So what, let's try to put a bit on a quantum particle, and I will represent this quantum particle by a particle being in two positions. And I will call zero, the particle being to the right, and I will call one, the particle being to the left, okay? But now you open a textbook in quantum physics, and the, quantum, and the textbook tells you postulate one, to every physical system, you associate a Hilbert space. And a vector of the Hilbert space is a state, a valid state of your system. So if your system can be in state zero, okay, representing the zero, and in state one, and I already put cats to, to, to show that it's a quantum state, then, since there is a Hilbert space behind, this quantum bit can also be in the superposition of zero and one. Okay, this is the, I mean, this is just first postulate of quantum physics in action. But it already tells you that the quantum bit is different. And if it's different, possibly you can do different things with it. Okay, and let's say this is what quantum information theory is about. Okay, because qubits can be in these superpositions. And now the field is, uh, okay, I think it was always quite active. Uh, I mean, I made my PhD uh, in the early 2000 and it was a, an active field, but now it's experiencing also a boom because there are important investments worldwide and also by private companies. And for instance, in Europe, we have the flagship on quantum technologies and I will use the flagship just to represent somehow the four main directions that we have in quantum information theory. There are many, but okay, somehow it has been described by this picture here, and you see there are four main vertical pillars that appear. And of course there is a, a very important pillar, which is the pillar on basic science. And mostly, most of the research I do is basic science. But I will now, for, for what follows, focus more on these pillars, okay? Just to tell you the applications people expect. So there, there are applications on metrology. And here also you can see also a, a bit the, the different uh, attitude we, you have towards quantum physics. So there are properties in quantum physics that somehow you don't tend uh, to like much, or let's say th that are surprising when you study quantum physics. So something that we know is that quantum effects are very sensitive to the environment. Okay, quantum supervisions are fragile. Well, in metrology you turn this into an advantage. Okay, something is very sensitive, well, this means that you can use these to measure uh, uh, interesting uh, properties with high sensitivity, with high precision, okay? And this is metrology, okay? You want to use quantum phenomena to measure things, okay? Like, I don't know, Bose-Einstein condensate to measure external fields. I don't know, I'm, okay, let's say I'm not actively working in metrology, but I think it's clear that if you have something sensitive, this is potentially useful to measure things. 
Then there are two other pillars that are called computation and simulation. I, I prefer to put them, I mean, uh, sort of together, okay? So what is computation? What is a computer? Well, a computer is a machine that takes bits, makes operation on bits, and produces bits as a result, okay? Well, a quantum computer will be the same. So we know it will take quantum bits, it will make an operation on quantum bits, and quantum textbooks tells us that any operation is described by a unitary uh, operation. On the, on the Hilbert space describing the qubits, and then you will get some output qubits. As, I mean, it's the same as our classical computers, but now uh, with a quantum support. Okay, and then we want to understand how this machine would solve uh, problems in the same way as uh, we are trying to understand how our machines can solve computational problems. But now we will do it using a different set of rules, the rules of quantum physics. Okay, this is computation, and we also have simulation. So what is the role of simulation? Well, in science, I mean, we have many problems that we cannot solve today because they are very complex. They are computationally very demanding. I think an example that is quite known by physicists is solving the bose haber model, okay? Or solving condensed matter models, or solving problems in quantum chemistry, okay? These are hard problems because we don't have computers to solve them. So possible strategies the following. You take the Hamiltonian that you're interested in, and now you engineer a setup uh, whose interactions are described by the same Hamiltonian. And now you, what you do, you say cool down this setup and you reach the ground state. And then you can measure it and you solve, you simulate the system of interest by a well-engineered quantum setup. Okay, so you engineer a setup that has the same Hamiltonian as the Hamiltonian you want to solve for a different problem. And then once you have this, you cool down the system and then you have the ground state, which is what you want to find. And then you measure, and measuring this, you can uh, infer properties about the ground state you are interested in. Okay, this is simulation. Well, it's the same I, I'm doing with a, a classical computer when I want to simulate something, okay? I write the Hamiltonian, and I solve it. Here, I'm solving the Hamiltonian with a quantum computing device. Maybe not a quantum computer, but a quantum simulator. Okay, to me, these are more or less the same type of, of devices. They are quantum computation devices. Okay, one case we call quantum computer, quantum simulator, but it's just devices that using the quantum physical laws try to solve a computational problem of interest. And for instance, now people are working on, on this because we don't have a quantum computer, but we start having quantum computing devices, okay? Maybe not the most general quantum computer you can think of, but complex setups, and then they are working on architectures that are hybrid, okay? So you take your best classical computer, you put together a quantum machine that may be good for solving some problems, and you make them to work together to solve, say, a relevant optimization problem. And people are really following this approach and hoping that at some point we will solve a problem with the help of quantum physics in a better way than with a classical computer. I mean, you can only gain in this situation, okay? Because either this gives you something better or you stay the same, okay? Because if it doesn't give you anything better, you throw it away. But if it gives you something better, you will have a better uh, computational device. Okay, so I, I was telling you about sensing, then about computers, and now what we have today in our society, we connect these computers through the internet. Well, then once you move to the quantum world, you want to do the same, okay? You will have quantum computers and you will want to connect them using quantum communication, okay? So quantum communication, the goal is to establish what is sometimes called the quantum internet, how to connect these devices, okay? So you will need to exchange quantum states from one place to another that we will pro be processed by the quantum computing devices in the different locations. And, and an application in which we are quite active in the group is quantum cryptography, okay? So this is a, a, an instance of quantum... Oh, I cannot go back. Yes, an instance of... Ah, yes, I was making a mistake. An instance of quantum communication. So here you have Alice and Bob. These are the standard honest users in cryptography. They want to exchange uh, private uh, information. And there is an enemy that is usually called Eve for eavesdropper. And quantum cryptography tells you, okay, if they want to exchange private information, they can put this information on quantum bits, okay, that represent this. And when the eavesdropper tries to read the, the quantum information here, we know that there is something called uh, uncertainty principle. So her action, trying to read the information, will perturb the system, and this will be noticed by Alice and Bob, who will stop the insecure communication, okay? So based on this intuition, it's not as simple as what I'm saying, but based on this intuition, you can make uh, secure cryptography based on Heisenberg and Saturday principle. Again, something that we usually perceive as something negative, the fact that in, in the intervention by the observer 
perturbs the state of the system is now here turned into an advantage. Based on this perturbation, you can make secure, uh, you can design secure ways of information transmission. Okay, another application that also sometimes is included in, in, uh, in quantum communication, but it's, I think it's an application by itself, is quantum random number generator. Okay, so our computers have random numbers, and we know that quantum physics is a natural source of randomness. Okay, so people are using quantum devices to produce good randomness. And the logic is, you, you can describe it by this simple experiment, okay? Well, not that simple, but it's simple to, to understand. So you, if you send a single photon into a bin splitter, then you create the superposition of being transmitted or, or reflected, and you, when you measure this, you get 50%. But again, this is a random, perfect random number, okay? But again, we know that, as I was telling you, quantum physics is a source of randomness, because if you open, again, a quantum physics textbook, many of the predictions of quantum physics are in probabilistic terms, okay? You always see probabilities computer with the bone rule, okay? And this is what people, why people are interested in making random numbers based on quantum physics. Okay, so it's happening, okay? So there are companies and, and you, there, there is, you have products in the market, you have quantum cryptography, you have uh, random number generators. I don't think we have any commercial quantum simulator, but maybe we won't ever have any, but in the, group, in the labs, people are doing quantum simulators. And we have some machines that people claim that are quantum computers, so these things are happening. Now, what, what is the problem we are interested in here? Okay, so these devices are expensive. So imagine you, poor, poor user, you buy one, decide to buy one of these devices. You will get this box. So you may wonder, is this, a quantum, is this really a quantum computer? Or is this really properly simulating a system? Is this cryptographically secure? Is this quantum random? Okay, so you will get a device and you want to ensure that this device is behaving in a quantum way. Well, this is certification, okay? This, this is what we would like to understand. And this is what I mean by certification of quantum technology, okay? So it's a very broad uh, uh, concept or problem that affects basically any quantum information technology application and which is not, not easy sometimes because the quantum computer is, or the quantum simulator is supposed to do things that you cannot do with your classical devices. So it's not evident how to simulate with your uh, insufficient classical devices the good behavior of a quantum uh, uh, device. And I always use this joke for, to represent this uh, certification, okay? In this case, this is for a random number generator. So imagine this is a quantum random number generator, okay? From the outside, I can put here, I can tell you that this is a quantum random number generator. Okay, it doesn't look like a quantum random number generator, but let's think that this is a, a, a box that you buy for a provider. And now you say like, is this a ra and then you wonder whether this is a random number generator, and the random number generator, say quantum, gives you this sequence of numbers, 9999. Well, you may wonder whether this is random or not, but okay, you can never be sure because the probability that a, a very good random number generator, say quantum random number generator, gives you the sequence 9999 is the same as any other sequence, okay? So this is why the guy, I mean here, doubts that you, can, you will ever be sure that uh, something is random, okay? But in quantum physics, you can certify that things are random, okay? So this is an application of me, from the outside, as I will try to tell you briefly, you can certify that the device is producing good quantum randomness. And more in general, so what we want to do, we want to certify a quantum device from the statistics it generates. Okay, so here we want to certify, say that this is a good quantum random numbers from the statistics it generates. I don't, I don't want to open the box. You are the poor user who gets a quantum computer from a provider, you are never going to open the box and check that the computer is running a serial, it's, produced, it's uh, creating superposition uh, among superconducting qubits. I mean, you don't want to do these things, okay? You want to certify a device with your poor man classical techniques. And for that, we, well, we, I mean, a, a scenario was introduced in which we were quite active, which is a device independent scenario. So what is the motivation here? So we want to do a quantum information theory for black boxes. Because if you want to certify things, you have to work in, in a scenario in which your devices are just black boxes that produce information for you, but where you don't know what's going on inside the box. 
because you are never going to open a quantum computer, you are never going to open a, a quantum random number generator, you are never going to open a quantum cryptographic solution. So you should see it as a box that you get from a provider. And we want to do quantum information theory in this black box picture. And the only thing you can use from these boxes is the statistics they generate. So you will make some actions on these boxes and you will get some inputs, some outputs. So you will have some inputs, you will perform some actions, you will press some buttons, you will, you will shine some lasers, but you will perform some actions and you will get some outputs. Some detectors will click or the, the machine will give you some results. And we want to say interesting things about these boxes, okay, whether it solves a problem, whether it's a cryptographically secure, whether these outputs are random, only from the statistics you see. And the statistics, I mean the probabilities of seeing some outputs given some inputs. Okay, this is why we introduced this device independent scenario, which you can understand as a quantum information theory with black boxes. Okay, so it's more or less a bit less than half of the talk. I was telling you about the field, I was telling you about the applications, then I was telling you that the crucial problem for us is to understand whether the devices work well with our uh, limiting classical cap 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 capabilities. And we want to do it ideally in a black box scenario. And this is why we introduced this device independent scenario. Okay? So I get a box from my provider and I, from the statistics I want to say interesting things about my box. So if you think about it, you may say like, how can I man manage to do something like this, okay? Because this is like, it seems super simplistic, okay? It's just black boxes and they generate some statistics. How can I say interesting things about what's going on in my boxes from what I see from the output? So if you think about the demon in the joke, how can I certify that the process in the demon is intrinsically quantum random from the statistics I see, okay? So why is this possible? Well, and this is possible because there is something that I find uh, fascinating, or, and let's say it's my second take home message, is because we are dealing with physical correlations. And by correlations, I mean how devices produce statistics in a correlated way. Okay, so what is the object we are dealing with here? So I will have these boxes given by a provider, and they will generate some outputs given some actions on, on, on them. And I will describe this by this conditional probability of observing output A that can take R possible values and output B that can take R possible values when the input X is used and the output Y is used. What you should understand that these are just labels of your actions. Okay, I'm not saying that shine a laser and, and, uh, or apply a magnetic field because I'm a poor user who doesn't have control about these physical actions. For me, you should understand the device as something that I get from the provider where I can say press a button. I don't know what the button means, but I can for sure see that I press either button one, button two, button three, button four. And this is why I label by X. X1 means that I press button one or I put a knob in a given position is a microscopic action that I can see. Okay, so I have n possible actions that I can do in my device. I don't know what sits happening in my device, but I know that as a result of my action, a result is produced. You can see this result as the device having, say, some light bulbs, and sometimes one light bulb is uh, on. Okay, and A equal one means that light one is on, A equal two means that light one, two is on, and so on. Well, this is just a pictorial way of seeing. It's any action that you can perform on your device, but you don't attribute any physical meaning to this action. And what is that? You count frequencies, how many times I get result one here, and say three here, when I press button or I made action three here and four there. Do I need to put trust on the provider or do I have to open the box to, to compute these numbers? No. I spend some time pressing buttons and seeing results. Okay, so what is this object? It's just a vector of probabilities. They are positive and if I sum over the results, it's equal to one. Okay, so if I spend some time here making action one and action one, I will see that sometimes I see result one, 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 two, one, three, two, one, two, two. All these numbers are positive and sum up to one. I can do the same for now I press button one and I press button two here. Okay, I introduce input one and output two, and input two, and I see the outputs. Again, positive numbers that sum up to one. And so on, so on, until my all possible choices of actions or measurements or whatever you want to say, but any intervention 
on your device, and then you see all the results. These are again positive numbers that sum up to one. This is the object we deal with. So we are doing a quantum information theory, but we are not dealing with Hilbert spaces. We are dealing with this object. So what is an example? Let's assume that the, here you perform two actions on your boxes and you get two outputs. Okay. So for instance, first you, you press button one or you say x equal to zero to your box and Alice with one box and Bob, another user with the box. And then they see that when they use zero, zero, the box says plus plus with probability one half. Well, this means that this number is one half. But you see that in one half of the cases, the boxes say minus one and minus one, but again in a correlated way. So you, this number is equal to one half. Of course, these numbers have to be zero. Okay, when you use input zero, zero, you get plus plus with probability one half, minus minus with probability one half, and you never get plus and minus because probability have to sum up to one. Okay? Well, and let's assume I'm inventing this. I'm inventing this table of probabilities. Why not? Okay, they are positive, they sum up to one. So I assume that the same happens when I choose zero and one here, the same when I choose zero, one and zero here. And let's say when they press one and one, it's the opposite. So they, they either get plus minus or minus plus. I'm inventing this, okay? Do you see any problem with this table? Well, no, it could happen, no? Why not? You make an experiment, you make two measurements, and you get this correlation between the two particles, why not? Well, so this is what I want, I want to tell you. I mean, we are physicists, and we now understand that the type of vectors you can get, that you can think of, like the one I'm showing here, the, the, the numbers you can get here, the positive numbers that sum up to one, depend on your physical theory. Okay, and I think this is a very important uh, message. Let's say, what is something that many people, many physicists uh, buy or agree on? Uh, Einstein causality. Okay, so we believe that uh, you can design experiments in which if I perform an action on my device here and Bruno has another device, we can arrange the situation so that uh, what he sees does not depend on my action. For instance, because things are synchronized in such a way that light cannot travel from my place to his place. Okay. So then, what, I, uh, we, what we will assume in this situation, because we are physicists, is that what he sees, his probability distribution, does not depend on my action, because otherwise I could signal to him faster than light. Okay? If, by making an action here, I can modify what he sees, I can change what he sees, and he can understand my action, so I can communicate with him faster than light. Okay. I believe this is not possible, and many people believe this is not possible. Okay? This is telling you that what Bruno sees, what we sometimes call his marginal probability distribution, does not depend on my action, x2. Okay? So when you sum over my results, what he sees does not depend on my input. Well, this is trivial, but this is a mathematical constraint on these numbers. Okay? When you sum over a subset of the parties, what the other party sees does not depend on the input. So here I'm summing over k plus 1 up to n, and you see the over the results, and here the inputs don't appear. Okay, this is a mathematical constraint, but it's a mathematical constraint. So I cannot, in my previous tables, I cannot put any numbers there. They have to satisfy this, otherwise Einstein causality is violated. So, look at these numbers. It's for the situation, two measurements and plus and minus, okay? Is this, are these correlations no signaling, okay? Do they respect this principle of no signaling? Well, let's make some numbers, no? I mean, this is trivial. What I'm saying is that what Bruno sees, his probability of getting plus when he measures zero is equal to these two numbers, okay? So I sum over my results. So I sum over plus and minus when he measures zero. It's the sum of these two numbers. It's equal to one half. This is for the situation in which he measures zero and I measure zero. But of course, this number has to be the same when he measures zero and I measure one, okay? Well, it is, okay, because the sum of these two numbers is equal to the sum of these two numbers, okay? You see, if I had written here two numbers that sum up to something different than one and a half, these correlations would have violated Einstein causality. We don't like this, okay? So I cannot put any numbers there. Good. Before quantum physics, people believed that uh, things were described by classical physics, and then 
the correlations we were uh, expecting were of this form. This is called the classical correlation. Okay, so what is happening? What Bruno? So it could be that we share some correlations, Bruno and I, described by this lambda. They can be varied with time according to some probability. But what the output he sees depends on the input and the correlations we had established at the very beginning. Okay, in a deterministic way. That was classical physics. And what I, what I see in my place depends on my input and what was in the box. Okay, these are the, what is called classical correlations. For those who know the Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen paper, this is exactly the correlations that Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen um, were some, um, considering in, in their work. And we know that these correlations don't describe everything because quantum physics gives you correlation beyond that through the Bell inequality violation. I assume, well, I will explain this, okay? We are quantum physicists. How do we explain correlation in quantum physics? Well, you take a textbook, textbook, and it tells you, well, things are measuring, measurements acting on a quantum state. And since the measurements are in different locations, we put a tensor product. Okay, so some correlations are quantum. Whenever I can find a Hilbert space, and a pure state and some measurements on these Hilbert spaces, so that if I combine them with the Bohm rule, I get the statistics I see. Again, not any vector of numbers can be written in this form. Okay, so this is my definition of quantum correlations. So what do we know? Well, we know that these sets are different. Okay, so you can imagine here the screen as the space of correlations, this vector that I was writing. So it's a vector on R to a given power, okay? In my case, I was putting, say, a matrix of four times four, this one half and zero. If you remember, it was a matrix with 16 entries. So you can see this is a sort of R16 space. And we know that there is a set of classical correlations, which is the one I'm representing here, which is strictly included in the set of quantum correlations, which in turn is strictly included in the set of no signaling correlations. Okay, so if you give me numbers, Sometimes some probabilities will be in this set, sometimes in this other set, sometimes in this other set. Okay, this is what we know. So this is Bell's theorem, okay? There are some correlations that you can get when you measure entangled particles that you cannot describe with classical models. And this is the region of Bell's theorem. Any point here is quantum, has a quantum realization, but does not have a classical realization. Okay? And this is less known, but I mean, these people prove that there are some points that you cannot get with quantum, by quantum means, okay? So how do you get these points? I don't know, because our current understanding of nature is based on quantum physics, okay? But if one day someone finds some correlations by making an experiment, say, in some very remote galaxies, I don't know, or in CERN or whatever, if you find some correlations that are there, you are falsifying quantum physics in the same way as points here falsify uh, classical physics. Okay, don't ask me where to find these points. I don't know. I have no clue. But I, I can invent them. And this is related to Bell inequality, so I don't know how much you know about Bell inequalities, but a Bell inequality is something, again, that you describe with boxes, okay? So there is a sort of particle that prepare two particles, and you make measurements on these two particles with some given results, okay? So usually we think of entanglement, but there is nothing quantum in the description of a Bell inequality. It's just an experiment in which you prepare two boxes in which you perform some measurements and you get some outputs. And the most famous one is called CHSH, okay? So A1 is the result of box one where you make measurement one, and it can be plus or minus one. And B1 is the result of box two where you make measurement one, and it can be plus or minus one. And you take this combination of the measurement output. Okay, I hope it's clear what I'm saying, okay? A1 is what you see here when you press button one. And say, B1 is what you see here when you press button one. And B2 is the result here when you press button two. So what's, what, how much can be this value? Okay, let's assume that everything is plus and minus one, okay? Let's assume, for instance, that everything is plus. Okay, so the source sends some instructions to Bruno and me, and the instructions are, no matter what, what's the question, say plus. Okay, this is a possible experiment. How much is A1, B1? Well, it's plus one times plus one, it's a plus one. Okay, how much is this? Plus one. Plus one, minus one, so this is two. Okay, 
you can see that for all combinations of plus and minus one, this is never larger than two. This is very simple mathematics. Okay, I'm just taking plus and minus one and multiplying. Okay. Well, the surprising thing is that if you make a quantum experiment and you send entangled particles and you make these two measurements and you compute the same quantity, you get two square root of two. Okay. So why is it so? Well, I don't know. This is surprising, but I mean, I can tell you that this is a very simple quantum mechanical calculation. Okay, but this is something that you can ex explain by assigning predetermined values to the measurement outputs, plus and minus one. Because if everything is plus and minus one, you can never be larger than two. So what is this telling me? Well, what is CHSH? Well, CHSH is precisely this hyperplane. And everything below two, I mean, classical physics, you can not be larger than two, so you are behind this hyperplane. And there are points in quantum physics that are above this. Okay? And this is any violation of this CHSH. Okay? And we know, because people prove, that in quantum physics you cannot go beyond two square root of two. Okay? So how much this innocent point gives you for this uh, Bernier inequality? Well, you see, A1B1 is this first row when everyone measures one. And I'm telling you that it can be either plus plus or minus minus. So the product is always plus. 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 Here the product is plus or minus or minus plus. So the product is minus, so you get a minus. With a minus, you get a one, so you get four. So this is a point that gives a CHSA value of four, which is impossible in quantum physics. So it looks very innocent, but if you make an experiment in which you buy two measurements of two outputs on two particles, and you see this probability distribution, assuming that there is no communication okay, between them, because I'm, I'm thinking of, then quantum physics is wrong. So there is no way, no matter which Hilbert space is, no, I mean, you can put whatever you want, okay? So you can put a qubit, but you can also put a very complex Hilbert space or whatever. There is no quantum way of realizing these correlations. Quantum physics will be proven, will be falsified. And remember that we came to this question of characterizing black boxes, say, from a practical motivation, but then it's connected to very fundamental questions, like what are the limits on my correlations based on quantum physics? And this is something that we did with uh, Miguel Navasquez that we were mentioning before, some, some, some years ago, okay? So let's think of the following experiment. You have a lab, and there is a, a, a someone who goes to the lab and measures these statistics, okay? So he produces a state of two particles, he makes measurements on the two particles and gets these numbers. So what do you do with these numbers? Are they good? So the, 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 say the, the scientist who gets these numbers comes to you and says, look, I've been trying to describe these numbers with, uh, say, uh, two qubit with spin one half particles, and I'm unable to do it. Okay, what, what does he mean? Then you, you may tell him, OK, try, maybe you assume that it was spin one half, and maybe spin was uh, four. Try again. Okay, and then he tries with the tools to reproduce this number, he fails. Are these numbers quantum? Are they reproducible by quantum physics? And when I say this, I want this, the, the scientists to explore all possible quantum explanations, so all possible Hilbert spaces of all possible dimensions. Well, this is tricky, okay? So you need unbounded computational power. Well, what we did, we found a way of, of answering this question. Okay, so basically we have a series of tests that you can organize in a hierarchy. And if this test fails, you know that this point does not have a quantum realization. Okay, so this is something that we found. So somehow it's giving you limits to the space of quantum correlations from the outside. So what is happening, you can see it as this. The, the correlations measure are a point and you want to know whether they are quantum or they are within the quantum set or outside. This set is very hard to characterize. So what we did, we gave outer approximations to this set that are easier to characterize. Sometimes it's easier to characterize a larger set than a set. And this is what is happening here. So what we do is that if you give me these correlations, I run this easier test. And if the point is outside one of these sets, for sure it's outside the quantum set. If it's inside, I don't know. But I can give you ways of certifying that things are not quantum. So here, hypothetically, you would have the tools to falsify quantum physics. So if you take the point one half, zero, zero, one half, you run the first test, you see that it's not quantum. You take these numbers, you see that it's not quantum. 
Okay, so this technique that uh, we uh, derived gives you ways of approximating quantum physics from the outside. And this is useful for us because we want to find what is possible within quantum physics without in a black box picture. We don't want to associate any Hilbert space to the black boxes. It can be any. And here we have a technique to characterize quantum physics for arbitrary Hilbert spaces. I mean, I never use any Hilbert space, but the Hilbert spaces are always behind the scenes, okay? But I don't want to assume anything about the Hilbert spaces. They can be arbitrary. So this is why, for instance, you can certify uh, randomness in a quantum experiment, okay? So what you will need to do if you want to buy a quantum random number generator and you want to certify the quantum origin of your random numbers, you go to a provider and you buy a Bell test. And you run the Bell test and you check whether you observe a Bell violation between these two devices. If it's the case, the outputs are random. Okay, and we found this curve in, in a previous paper some years ago. So why are they random? Because if they are not random, they are predetermined in advance. They are plus and minus one. And for instance, the CHSH, if things are plus and minus one at the very beginning, you cannot be violate the CHSH building inequality. You are bounded by two. So if the value you get is larger than two, they cannot be predetermined. So the Bell violation certifies the randomness of the output. And it's a quantum origin because in classical physics you can never violate a Bell inequality. Yes, okay, maybe I'll try to explain the last thing. Um, okay, so let's make a <laughs> small stop. So I was telling you about quantum technologies, very general. Then I was telling you that we want to certify devices and we want to do it ideally in this black box scenario. And then this is connected to a very fundamental question to understand how quantum physics looks like for arbitrary Hilbert spaces because you want to consider that your box is a quantum black box, but you don't want to make any assumptions about what, I mean, you can make assumptions, but here we don't want to make any. And this is why we uh, were considering the question of characterizing quantum physics from the outside, let's say. And then using these tools, we uh, found protocols for certified quantum randomness generation. Okay, so it's, I, I like this, thought, this uh, line of research because you can do, you can uh, propose uh, technologies, but you also have to deal with fundamental questions in quantum physics. So the second question that, uh, that I'm representing here in my talk is the one in which you have, uh, you want to certify a quantum linear or simulator. So remember, I was telling you that these devices, they compute ground state energies. It's one of the applications. So, okay, you have a simulator and you want to certify the output, uh, the, you want to uh, estimate the ground state energy of the, say, Haber model. Okay, so you run the simulator and it gives you a number, 0 0.3. So what do you do with this number? Is it good or bad? Okay, so usually what people do, they take what the quantum machine produces and compares with what a classical machine produces. For instance, using uh, uh, variational ANSAS algorithms or Monte Carlo. Okay. And what you want to, you hope, is that one day the quantum simulator will give you a number that is better than what the classical devices produce. Okay, this means that your approximation, this is the ground state, you will get values by Monte Carlo, no? You never know whether you are at the, at the ground state, okay? You, you, and then one day the quantum computer will give you, a, or quantum simulator will give you a value that is smaller than all the values you have. All these values are always upper bounds to the ground state energy. Possibly they are the ground state energy, but you never know. Okay, there are many local minima, it's a very complex problem. So what, what do we want to do then? We know that any solution gives you upper bounds, so we want to find lower bounds. Because if we have a lower bound, then we can have an idea of how close we are to the solution. Okay, I don't have time to do that, but uh, okay. So how do you find a, a lower bound to a minimization problem? Okay, it happens that many Hamiltonian problems are polynomial problems. And then there is a theory of polynomial optimization in which you can understand here, okay? Imagine you want to find the minimum of this quantity over some, uh, over a set, and it's a polynomial, okay? What is the solution here? It's here, no? You see, this is the minimum. So how do you can get lower bounds? Well, sometimes, if you get an outer approximation to this set, you are finding the minimum of a, la a larger set, so the minimum you will get will be smaller or equal to the minimum you are looking for. So for instance, here, if you 
look of the minimum over the set gamma 1, you will get this point, which is for sure smaller than this. Okay, but this looks very similar to what I was telling you before. Okay, so we have now techniques that give outer but converging approximations to the set of interest, so you get lower convert a series of lower bounds converging to the actual solution. So now you, we can. I'm, I'm going a bit fast now, okay? But I hope you understand that we give outer approximation to the set of interest, and if you minimize over these outer sets, you will always get a lower bound to the quantity of interest. Okay, so I don't have time to explain all this, but okay, we did that. So what we did, we took a classical problem, a classical spin problem, spin glass. And this is one of the problems that D-Wave, one of the quantum computers, which is not a quantum computer, but okay, one of these quantum devices, is solving. Okay, so, and you see a classical spin problem is a polynomial problem with the spin variables. So it's one of the problems that fits into this category. So we went, okay, and we were running the, the D-Wave machine, and what we were doing was the following. So we were running the machine, and then we were comparing with our lower bound. If there was a gap, we asked the machine to run again, hoping that at some point uh, the two values uh, were the same. And it was happening in many cases, and it was funny because sometimes we were getting a value, we were not closing the gap between the upper bound given by the quantum computer machine and by our techniques, and we were asked the machine to do it again, to do it again, and then eventually the machine was finding the same value. And then we didn't uh, need to make more iterations because we knew we had found the right value. Okay, that was a bit fast. Okay, I'm sorry for this. But I hope you understood that with these sort of methods, we also have techniques to uh, certify the outputs produced by quantum simulators or quantum annealers, okay, when solving these Hamiltonian type problems. Okay, so I will give first, I think this is a very important message about information, okay? I think this is really something I, I always want to insist, and we now understand that information is physical, so quantum information is not the same as classical information. And I think information is a key concept for our understanding of nature, so if you want to really understand what information is, you have to also use physics, okay? So otherwise you are missing uh, something. So if you want to understand information, physics matters. And then I then move to this, uh, the, the the topics more related to, to our research. So one of the main themes in the group, I mean, we, we all do some other things, it's a large group, but we, we care about certifying quantumness of, of devices, okay? Because this is important for quantum technologies, but it also goes at a very fundamental question, which is what is the difference between classical and quantum physics, okay? Because if you want to certify that something is quantum, you should use a property that does not exist in classical physics, like a Bell inequality violation. Okay, then I was briefly telling you how these techniques we can give um, a certified randomness generation. Okay, I went quite quickly on that, but I hope you understood more or less the idea. And also how we use this to benchmark an existing commercial quantum annealer. Again, everything was a bit fast, but I hope you understood the motivations. And I think this is also, uh, there is a lot of, of things to do, again, not only for quantum technology, but for basic science. So, so now there are many labs in the world in which people prepare complex systems. I mean, Bruno knows many in which prepare, I don't know, uh, lattices, okay, optical lattices. They prepare systems made of hundreds or thousands of particles. So it's impossible for you to describe this system in your classical computer. I mean, thousand partic quantum particles that I mentioned you need for that, the number of parameters is huge. It's even impossible to measure them completely because you need to measure an exponentially growing number of parameters. Okay, so you will have incomplete information about these systems, and using this incomplete information, you want to say interesting things about these systems. So you want to certify that these systems have interesting quantum phenomena, which is again a problem of quantum certification. Okay, so you want to certify interesting quantum properties based on incomplete um, information used by classical devices. Okay, and this is what, what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so thank you very much. Can I speak?
So thank you very much for the very nice uh, presentation. Uh, I'm not completely sure, I'm sort of checking the chat, but I'm not completely sure people can actually ask questions there. So at least I don't see any questions here. So maybe I will uh, take, a, or maybe we can take a couple of questions because we are like three people here. But uh, I mean, I find it very interesting that this approach no, of uh, having completely black boxes and you don't care and you just try to phrase what kind of correlations are there bound by physical principles in a sense. But is there something, is there some mathematical theory behind that? I mean, why people in mathematics should have studied that, no? A statistical, in a statistical physics or something like that, probability theory, no? Mm, well, uh, I would say yes and no, okay? so. I mean, from the point of probability, what we are saying is something of trivial, okay? So you will have an experiment, you will perform some actions, you will get some output, you will count frequencies, and with these frequencies, you will estimate uh, probabilities, okay? So I don't think then people thought about, okay, what happens if I believe that these probabilities have a given physical origin, okay? This is quite, uh, and for instance, if you rethink Bell inequalities with this perspective, well, Bell inequalities are just common sense, classical physics, apply, you think like, okay, if we see some correlation between two objects and we believe that uh, what we see depends on my action and possibly something that was written there with classical information, then the probability I will get will be bounded by these inequalities, okay? And actually, I, I've been told, I, I never check, that if you go to the, the books, uh, book or some articles by Bull, the inventor of Bull algebra, he has Bell inequalities there, okay? Because you could have derived Bell inequalities without knowing quantum physics, okay? This is, I think, the only um, instance of the problem that was considered before. Of course, for quantum physics, again, people n knew that quantum physics goes beyond classical physics, and, and, but no one thought about, or very few people thought about, okay, what are the limits on correlations possible within the theory? which assumes that you have to explore all possible quantization, all possible Hilbert spaces. I, I believe that since it was a difficult problem, it didn't happen before. I see. And, and there is another thing when you uh, violate a main inequality, it is, uh, I mean, you have averages there, right? Mm -hmm. It's not single measurements, but you have to produce several averages and mm -hmm. build mm -hmm. this average uh, mm -hmm. measurement, mm -hmm. right? This mm -hmm. is, this is. Yes, well, but this is uh, science, no? I mean, yeah. you, there is no experiment that you run single shot. You always need to accumulate statistics. So in this sense, I don't think it's different. So just you need to estimate to make statistics to get confidence that your be devices behave. No, you have need. Uh, actually, then you use a lot of statistics to um, have a, a given confidence level that your statistics no, is a point. So if you want, if you think about my picture, you want to estimate frequencies, and you want these frequencies that correspond somehow to probabilities are outside the set of classical correlations. If you make very few experiments, your statistical error will be large, so you won't be, uh, you won't be able to ensure that the point is outside the classical set. And once you accumulate statistics, some of the statistical error decreases, mm -hmm. and at some point you know that your point is outside the classical set. I don't know if you follow what I'm saying yeah, with uh, my hands, but. I don't think this is different from any, any, when you want to see that a mass of a particle in high energy, you also make statistics, no, to, 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 to give a range of, of yes. parameters. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a question? Sure. Uh, there is Xavi Luri here. Hello. Uh, a question from a non-specialist. Uh, I'm not on quantum. Uh, but it's a question I have asked in other contexts in, uh, to a very famous specialist. What about the problem of interpretation of the quantum mechanics. Uh, the, the, the answer I got from this very famous person was that he didn't believe that quantum mechanics described macroscopic world, but I think we are past that. So that was many years ago. I think you are bringing quantum to, to the macroscopic world. We are using uh, quantum computers in a way that really affects. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, for a non-specialist, where is in the field now, the, the problem of the interpretation of the quantum mechanics, the problem of measurement? Okay, there are two things. One thing is the interpretation of quantum physics. So... Sorry, quantum physics, right. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. No, 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 it's okay. Um, so I think, 
I'm not a super expert on these things, but uh, um, many of the discussion on interpretations, uh, unfortunately, let's say, don't lead to different experimental predictions. Then it's mostly a discussion about interpretation rather than uh, whether uh, an interpretation gives a better, uh, well, it, it, well it, it can be falsified or not, okay? So it, it would be nice to see a, a situation in which an interpretation leads to some results and another interpretation to other, okay? But then maybe it wouldn't be called interpretation, but it would be called theory, okay? So from that point of view, the, the discussion about interpretations is not so scientific, okay? What is nice is that uh, um, it's, it's funny because I think many of the founders of quantum information theory uh, were um, for the uh, many word interpretation. And people say that this is why they thought about this quantum parallelism that you use in quantum computers when you make the qubits and you make superpositions and you run the computer which somehow is running over all possible superpositions. But maybe their interpretation of many words was useful for them to get this intuition. Okay, this is a parenthesis that has nothing to do with your question. But what I'm saying is that even if interpretations are not scientific, they are sometimes useful, okay? Now, your question also uh, contained the problem of the measurement problem. I think we still don't know anything, and it's, I find it's really, for me, it's one of the questions. So really, uh, in all what I said, I was making a black box, and I was making a distinction between the box, black box is getting classical information and producing classical information, but there is a quantum process there, no? So clearly I was putting, when designing this box, I was making a division between classical and quantum world, which is very related to the measurement problem because the measurement problem is the problem, the process that makes transform quantum into classical. I think this is for me uh, a fundamental question where we don't know anything. Now there are nice experiments because people are preparing uh, superpositions of massive particles of relatively large size and they seem to see superpositions uh, still. Uh, so it's nice because technologies are pushing some of this frontier and trying to move, as you say, quantum effects. But I think we, our knowledge is still almost zero. Okay, we will take another question. Hi. Uh, these black boxes that you are using to, to analyze, mm -hmm. Uh, they have memory, or they could have memory, or...? or yeah, it's a very good qu question. So, um, so here, we want some of the, the, the picture we have in mind is like you, poor, poor user, you go to the provider, you, black, you buy these black boxes, and you want to certify these black boxes are quantum, okay? And you have to assume that the worst can happen with these black boxes. So in principle, they could have memory, and produce the outputs depending on the past, okay? Which is somehow is missing in my in my description because I was writing probabilities, okay? Probability sometimes is uh, identically independent distribution of the same random variables, okay? Well, so you have to take into account memory, and there are tools from statistics, standard tools from statistics that allow you to take into account memory effects. So for for some protocols, you have to take into account memory effects, and we know how to do it. We don't have to invent anything. There are techniques in statistics that allow you to take uh, into account memory effects for boxes. Just a short question. So, for, for instance, just for certifying that, let's say, a source is producing entangled particles, you would, I mean, your, your tool would be a Bell test. Yes. So, the only device independent entanglement detector is a Bell inequality. Because if some black boxes don't violate a Bell inequality, I always have a classical explanation. Hence, I can always explain without entanglement. If you make some extra assumptions, for instance, you say, no, no, I know that these are quantum black boxes, but of dimension two. Then you may be able to certify entanglement without going to a Bell inequality. But if you want to do it in a fully device independent black box scenario, the only way you can certify the presence of entanglement is through the violation of a Bell inequality. Okay. I mean, it's just a matter of assumptions, okay? So if you're happy, let's say, you're happy you make an ion trap experiment, and you're happy to say, okay, I have my ion here, and I will assume that it's a two-dimensional particle, mm -hmm. in the sense that you're only uh, populating two levels. 
that's fine, that's a qubit. But you may say, well, I think assuming that an ion is a two-dimensional object is a very strong assumption, okay? It's, it's up to you, up to the user, or up to the scientist to make more assumptions about your setup, or living at this minimalistic level in which you don't make any assumption. Mm -hmm. and, and I have a, just a, a last question on myself. Is this a stuff that you presented in the end that you find lower bounds? Mm -hmm. This I find very exotic because I, I I don't know that any more people are actually producing that. Did you find some uh, concrete example where this is useful? Okay, so uh, for I think for this, the lower bounds we can find for classical systems. I mean, there are other people who, who did that before us, okay? So we are not the first, but okay, we have this good understanding of these outer approximations and we thought we could use them. And we are doing this now, okay? So before this meeting, I had a meeting with people where we are considering quantum systems. But for classical systems, it was useful. So we, we, we could uh, really run and we could, uh, for many cases, we could really find a very good lower bounds for classical uh, spin glasses. Of course, we, I mean, you should, okay, something I didn't have time to mention is that we are not competitive with Monte Carlo, for instance. Okay, so Monte Carlo can reach system sizes that we cannot. So it's not as powerful as other methods in terms of system size. I will take one question that we received from email from Jordi Miranda, the, from the scientific director. He said, there is a question on whether the amount of information required to describe perfectly a physical system is finite or infinite or infinite. In classical physics, if you want to specify a variable like momentum of particle perfectly, you need infinite accuracy and so infinite information. Mm -hmm. Do you think the amount of information in the physical state of a system is finite or infinite? Well, I think it's infinite, yes. Okay. Yes, but uh, okay, somehow here, uh, yes, I mean, I think if you want to fully specify a system, you need infinite information, but here somehow you are uh, being also quite uh, brutal, and your, back, uh, you, your black box, you will, out of the possible infinite information, you only focus on two degrees of freedom, so whether a light one is on, or whether, so, you make an experiment over a particle, say a photon, how much information you need for a photon? Infinite, you need to specify the frequency, the polarization, whatever. But here, in this description, I only care about the photon, whether it clicks in this detector or this other detector. And this, when it clicks here, I will call it plus one, and when it clicks there, we call it minus one. This is all I, what I care about. I so I'm taking a finite dimension projection on my very complex uh, particle. Okay, and uh, so I think we will close it, so, because it's okay. So, <laughs> first we thank Tony for coming here and delivering this very nice colloquium and bringing us the frontier of this quantum certification, which is gonna be something that we are gonna hear in the future. And thank everybody for watching and see you next time. Thank you. This is